Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Island Finance Forum 2023. We're so happy to have you here and to see the wide variety of people, over 6,000 people so far, who've signed up from all over the world to join this event. It's going to be a really exciting week. And so thanks again for joining us. This is the third year that we've held the Island Finance Forum. And this year we're delighted to be supported by PwC in the Caribbean. So thank you to all the team there for supporting this event. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you later in this session and during the week. Um, this event, the Island Finance Forum, emerged from the Virtual Island Summit, uh, which is our flagship event every September. But we realized that we really needed to hold a new event to bridge the gap between policymakers and the finance sector when it comes to sustainable development. So this event is perhaps slightly narrower in focus than our previous event, uh, the Virtual Island Summit, for those of you who attended in September. Um, but the focus on finance is absolutely crucial for moving forward with sustainable development policy. Um, whenever we talk about sustainable development, whether it's waste management, tourism, renewable energy, the question always comes back down to finance and the specific issues that islands and island nations have when it comes to accessing finance that works for them. So with that being said, I'd love to hear who you are and where you're here from. So a poll will be appearing on your screen right now, and we would be delighted if you would answer that and tell us a bit about the region that you're joining from um, and also the sector that you belong to. Um, while you're doing that, I'll also note that we're streaming all of our sessions on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So hello to everyone joining there and watching from wherever you uh, are joining from. I can see in the chat we have people from Guatemala, Grenada, the Cayman Islands, Fiji, Barbados, Shanghai, Papua New Guinea, uh, Miami, Taiwan, Scotland, uh, Austria, Jamaica, Haiti. So it's a really great to see the range. Feel free to go ahead and add where you're coming from in the chat. I always love to see this wide variety of people joining. Hello, Bermuda, Guyana, Virgin Islands, Portugal. Um, fantastic. As you might know, we started um, our series of virtual events before the pandemic because we realized that um, even when it was less common and less widely known, there was a need for island communities to be able to connect with each other and share information. And so we're absolutely committed to this virtual structure for our events to unite this global island community and give opportunities for sharing knowledge and information. But I also wanted to let you know that we have a series of in-person events coming up um, over the next year with plans for um, programs in Africa, the Caribbean and Asia in the future. But specifically in June, we have our first uh, in-person event on the blue economy taking place on the island of Madeira in Portugal. So a link to register your interest on that will be in the chat and uh, do keep an eye out for more information on that event if you'd like to join us in person in Madeira, Portugal, uh, later on this year. So with that, I'll just take a quick look at the poll results before I go ahead and introduce our speakers. You can see that we have the largest group from the Caribbean, as I expected, um, and also people from Europe, North America, Asia, Pacific. And we have a pretty even mixture, about 50% in the private sector, but also people from academia, NGOs, and of course, government. Um, so great, you should be able to see that on your screen if you're interested to know more. So with that, I we are absolutely honored to have some high level speakers from uh, different island nations in different parts of the world. And we'll go into a short series of opening remarks uh, from each of these um, important government representatives to introduce the specific issues and opportunities that they see around finance uh, when it comes to sustainable development. So with that, I would like to introduce the Honorable Lourdes uh, Aflag Leon Guerrero, who is the ninth governor of Guam in the Pacific and the first female governor of the territory. She's also a registered nurse, a businesswoman, a policymaker, a mother, and a grandmother, which I love. Thank you so much for joining us once again, Governor. 
Um, and I know it's late at night there, so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us in person. Thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, James. Half a day from Guam to all of you all over the world. It is my distinct honor to have this opportunity to speak with you today at the 2023 Island Finance Forum. Everyone in attendance may be a stakeholder, a practitioner, or, or both coming together to bridge the gaps of sustainable development in global island communities. I have seen over, I have overseen the economic, social, and political development of our island of Guam for over four years now as the governor. Prior to then, however, I served as a banker, a nurse, and community leader. It is through the lens of these roles that inform my policy and advocacy decisions today. Guam just finished hosting the 14th Conference on Island Sustainability. This was a great forum for planning, development, and most importantly, reporting and accountability concerning the island's progress towards sustainable development. I was inspired by the numbers of students from primary through graduate school level who were concerned with growing the island's economy and finding opportunities, but with a perspective towards the environmental and social responsibility to build a better community. I also learned from scientists the value of innovation that marries modern technology with sustainable solutions. A few years ago, I tasked the economic development arm of our government to identify tax incentives that may help make waste reduction more economically feasible. We soon thereafter passed legislation to offer across the board tax abatements and rebates to companies offering to remove waste from the waste stream. The first company to apply and be approved is a company reducing the auto tire waste by up to 60% was passed just last year. That makes a difference on an island where future waste arrives on ships and dies in our landfills. Guam has a set a goal to achieve 100% renewable energy for our electricity grid by the year 2045. In tandem with this process, we are also working to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles through several public policy measures ranging from government procurement to tax incentives, as I mentioned earlier. By shifting the energy needs for transportation to a power system based on renewable energy, it is our objective to sharply reduce our dependence on expensive fossil fuels, which significantly increases our cost of living. Through the years, I have seen the footprint of the tourism industry clean up its act not only because consumers demand it, but also because it is good for business. Any sustained positive change is significant, as our small island was receiving almost 2 million visitors a year pre-pandemic. Water conservation, utilizing native species to reduce the importance of invasives, changing construction and maintenance program for energy efficiency, all of these practices make good business sense. How then do I, as a leader, continue to encourage this behavior? The truth is saying no only goes so far. We banned plastic bags, we pushed forward zero waste policies and have limited activities that contribute to coral bleaching. But even then, how do we make an impact for the good of our island? but even more so for the good of our global economy. And this is where the collaboration between stakeholders and practitioners in convenings like today can come together to exchange ideas and argue how our solutions have positive or negative outcomes when being applied to our unique economies.
As the world recovers from the economic setbacks resulting from the COVID pandemic, your work on identifying financing options to support sustainable and inclusive economic growth in the islands is needed now more than ever. But there remains a gapping hole in access capacity. Guam is less affected by rising sea levels as we are through coral bleaching and the destruction of our reefs. Why? This is a threat to our in indigenous food system, but also hinders our potential growth in aquaculture innovation. We have a university and a government capable of managing large amounts of money. Just pandemic aid alone to U.S. territories and states resulted in over $1 billion to the island for our territorial projects. But our status as a U.S. territory often precludes Guam from accessing resources made to the global community, such as from the Asian Development Bank. I make this argument not out of the complaint, but out of feedback for you today. Our islands are beautiful and our cultures are unique and just as new ones are our government structures. Navigating through delivering solutions to each island community takes exceptional perseverance and dedication. I argue that it takes an island to understand our fellow islands. The more we promote regional cooperation and interdependence, we get cohesive solutions. Guam looks like certain islands economically, other islands socially, and other islands environmentally. I believe Guam has the capacity to administer large amounts of capital and remain accountable to donors, grantors, and the like. Where we need to be viewed and considered is closer to our island counterpart versus an extension of the continental USA. There are advantages we can tackle as an island region. I had first-hand knowledge of this when I was a banker. Starting a small business is for the adventurous, no matter if you are doing in a population center or the remotest of islands. Access to capital is key. Systematizing, systematizing made it affordable, but the personal relationship really brought out the best in our local entrepreneurs across the region and increased the odds of success. There are similar stories you will find in the transportation space, energy and fuel and others. I would like to see the same application to regional healthcare and innovation, wherein we keep our valuable human capital on our islands with our people and we do not sacrifice economically. Getting there requires regional planning in these spaces, collaboration, and experts who can help us layer the opportunities for financing and development. In Guam, I tasked a small group of my adv advisors to research just U.S. federal funding opportunities to engage in finding money to build a state-of-the-art medical campus that serves our island and the region at large. That space alone finds intersections in traditional healthcare, behavioral health, teaching and capacity among indigenous populations, and just plain old fashioned looking for free money to build big buildings. If I could navigate the world of access to financing outside of US borders, I can view this as a tremendous contribution to the island of Guam and to the many islands we are all concerned with here today. I leave you with a quote from Chief Hurao, an indigenous leader of the Chamorros, the Aboriginal people of Guam. Tita nisisita adzudan sanhizun para tafalmala gini gitanota taza talu. Satisfied with what our islands furnish, we desire nothing else. I thank you for your time and attention and look forward to all the learning in the coming days. Thank you so much, Governor, for that important address. And it's great to hear about the specific opportunities. I know that there is so much happening in Guam when it comes to sustainable development. 
and um, the specific issues of Guam as a US territory in accessing certain types of finance, I think are very important. So we really appreciate you being here to set the scene for these discussions through the rest of the week. And we'll look forward to following more of what is happening from uh, Guam when it comes to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next we will be traveling to the central Atl Atlantic Ocean uh, to Bermuda. Um, it, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the Honorable Walter Roban, the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Home Affairs from the Government of Bermuda. Um, Minister Roban has served as the Deputy Premier and, and in the Minister with a, with a career spanning uh, nearly 30 years in policy and community. I had the pleasure of meeting the Minister at the COP27 climate, sorry, COP26 climate conference. It was in Glasgow, wasn't it? Um, where you were representing Bermuda and making the important call for action on uh, sustainability and climate change there in Glasgow. We hope we'll see you at our Island Innovation event in COP28 in Dubai this year. So Minister, thank you very much for being here and over to you. Thank you, James, for the opportunity to be here with this esteemed panel and to be a part of the inaugural event and seminar of the Island Finance Forum, Island Innovation Finance Forum 2023. I think it's great that we have these opportunities as island communities to come together, to talk, share ideas and work across the globe on solutions that are particularly important to the global island community. Though Bermuda is in the North Atlantic, we feel we're a part of the larger global family of islands. Certainly the uh, Caribbean region just south of us and whether it be the Pacific, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, other parts of the world, we feel we're a part of a larger island family. And it's very clear and already understood that the issues of climate, sustainable development and how islands are impacted and how we're going to respond to it are certainly issues unique to our experience because we're on the front line. We're on the front line on the impacts, we're on the front line for the issues, we're on the front line for the challenges. So forums like this and island innovation and the work that is done helps all of us to be better at responding to these all of the issues that I've outlined. Bermuda, though isolated in the North Atlantic and the Mid-Atlantic, I would perhaps even be more appropriately, we are not immune to the issues that are being faced around climate change. And because of that, certainly the government and the community has been very responsive to the rising concerns about climate change and how it's impacting island communities. And because of that, a number of things certainly in Bermuda we've done to actually make sure that we as an island are preparing and are being responsive and doing what's necessary. Most islands aren't huge contributors to the greenhouse gas effect, but we clearly are being impacted by the greenhouse gas effect. So a number of years ago, Bermuda started on a course just to ensure that we were doing things differently. We, like many communities, have been powered by fossil fuel generation for over 100 years. But it's very clear that this needed to change. So back in 2018, Bermuda adopted her first integrated resource plan, which set out a path towards transitioning from fossil fuel generation primarily to renewables. So our integrated resource plan has a goal of Bermuda transitioning to 85% of renewable energy generation by 2035. This will include about 21 megawatts of solar, of which we are very much on our path to meeting that goal. It will mean 60 megawatts of wind, and it will mean decommissioning of around 71 megawatts 
of fossil fuel generation over that period of time. We are also looking at innovation. We also understand that much of the technology that is already available can help the world and certainly island communities reach much of our energy goals. But if we are going to, by 2030 and 2035, be substantially de decarbonize in generation, but by 2050 reaching net zero, a lot more technology is required globally, but also for our islands. So Bermuda has also embraced innovation and we've made changes so that we can embrace innovation. We are currently looking at allowing the deployment of wave energy as part of the mix to at least be tested in Bermuda to see if it will be feasible, it will be commercial and viable. If it can be, it can be a part of our overall energy mix. Other islands are also looking at this. There's been a great interest globally in the use of the oceans around us. We are surrounded by oceans. And of course, so it makes sense that if you have, we have substantially more ocean real estate than land real estate. So let's use the ocean as an opportunity to reach our sustainable, development and energy goals. We also understand, as already has been said by the governor, finance is important. This particular session, this forum is about island finance. Finance is crucial to all of us reaching the sustainable development and goals of transition towards cleaner energy and cleaner, environmentally safe futures. But that finance doesn't exist within our islands in the amounts that is required. So the global community, and when I say the global community, I'm talking about the public and non-public sector areas that are about development financing and infrastructure financing are required to also be a part of this picture. And it's gonna mean deploying innovative financing tools. I can recall from the experience that I had at COP, I was quite encouraged, not as much by the decisions by the governments, but I was even more encouraged by the interest in the private sector being involved with finding solutions to help finance the transition globally and certainly amongst um, you know, small island and developing states on how we're going to finance our transition towards a cleaner renewable energy future and environmental and social governance. There was a lot of creative ideas I saw being expressed as to how this could be financed. And many are now parking up to be involved who may have not been involved some year, just a few years ago to helping devise financing options that will not only be public, but also private. It is now very clear that long-term investment in renewable energy options is a lot more lucrative than investing in fossil fuel options. Yes, we are in a very challenging world right now due to a number of factors, which puts pressure on growth, which puts pressure on energy needs, and which presses on ensuring sustainable communities. But we must push forward with looking at how we can finance the transition for all communities, particularly island communities, towards green energy, towards sustainable options and sustainable development. And obviously there are different ideas being floated around, around how the international finance community can actually re-engineer how finance is accessed. We've seen the Barbados Declaration as something that I believe will be discussed at this conference as another option. And there are other key players in finance that have made it very clear that looking to pursue environmental and social governance, ESG priorities is important, not only to the public sector, but also to the private sector. Um, huge companies like BlackRock and Larry Fink have made it very clear that 
their enormous capacity to invest will be guided by, by companies having strong ESG priorities. So we as countries must also ensure that we have our priorities straight. We must not only embrace environmental and social governance, we must also embrace legislative and regulatory frameworks that support sensible and reasonable development that not only protects our own economic livelihoods, our environment, but also our public. And it's important as we ourselves begin to embrace things such as electrification of transport, renewable green generation, better environmental protections for our environment around us, ocean, air, and land, we must have the appropriate legislative frameworks in place so to show the private community and the public community that we are serious about these objectives and goals as islands. I also believe we must also ensure that the projects that we would like to see invested in, whether it be through some level of public support, but also private support, are designed to be investment ready, that they are projects that can go to the marketplace and support the financing priorities that will allow them to be achieved. This has not always been the case in the past, particularly with uh, public sector financing, but I believe we must learn from our private sector friends is to okay design packages to invest in infrastructure, to invest in energy infrastructure, to invest in infrastructure that's going to mitigate um, the impacts of climate change, our adaptation infrastructure, make sure that it's designed with good investment proposals that can attract some sort of financing from the private sector. But where the, where the, like the public sector can support, it sh there should also be support from the public sector. But mindful that in most island communities, we are struggling to pay for healthcare, education, security, and overall um, social governance. So pushing monies towards the support of financing energy generation is extremely costly and can tie up priorities that we need to put elsewhere. So having a balanced approach with getting public sector to de-risk certain types of projects so that the private money can come in is a way we should go. And this is some of the conversations I know that are being had with the international donor community, particularly on the public side. So there are many things that I think we as islands need to do and to focus on to actually ensure that we are positive environments for investment, for financing our sustainability and our transition to a cleaner, renewable, safe energy future. So, and it's, and it's by coming together in forums like this that we're going to discuss, devise solutions and have plans the way forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be a part of this. I look forward to hearing the ideas from those on the panel and from others over this forum so that we all can move forward together. Thank you very much. And everybody have a very good conference. Thank you so much, Deputy Premier, for those opening words, again, helping us to set the scene for the conversations here. And it's very exciting to see the leadership um, of uh, Bermuda on these issues, and particularly when it comes to the finance sector. A lot of very exciting things happening in Bermuda. Um, we'll now move on to uh, introduce the Honourable Minister, Dr. Denzel Douglas, the Minister for Foreign Affairs international trade, industry, investment, and economic development for the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, Minister Douglas is a medical doctor by background, but has been in uh, policy and government for some time now. And we are honored to have St. Kitts and Nevis represented at this forum. So Minister, over to you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasant good morning to all, and in particular to our friends in the Pacific, good evening. 
At the outset, I wish to register my congratulations to, um, to you, James, and the entire team at Island Innovation for the outstanding work you have done in convening island leaders and stakeholders from across every jurisdiction at this forum. An opportunity to share a panel with the distinguished leadership of Guam, Tuvalu, and Bermuda. In fact, I emphasize it should occur more regularly. This panel and forum represents a diverse set of people, each with our own harrowing story of climate loss and inaction. We also have in common, though, an unfailing and inspiring desire to protect and preserve our own unique island way of life. As the discourse and contours of the climate crisis evolve, I believe that islands represent the core moral leadership of the world for peace, for progress, and prosperity. Prosperity that is not defined by profit, but firmly anchored on nature and biodiversity. In speaking of strategic partnerships, we as island leaders, while calling our people to action to fight what United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called a war against nature, we must also do something much further. We must go against the prevailing narrative of being victims or small and as being on the periphery. We need to move away from those. Islands are the manifestation of Earth's amazing ability to regenerate and to survive. But we also need to thrive while we are surviving. So instead of us continuing to be informing, we need to continue to be innovating. We need to continue, as most importantly, to be investing in islands for our true sustainable development. It is my hope that at the end of this forum, we will come away with enhanced partnerships. We will come away with better understanding and an enhanced willingness to engage with each other, islands to islands, so that we can create among ourselves opportunities for inter-island investments and inter-island innovations. Though we stretch across oceans, I believe by coming together virtually, and of course in person, just as we do through EOSIS and other fora, that we can together inject greater impetus in global climate action and justice in the economic and investment space by partnering on strategic projects. Islands have a role to play in the global supply chain in green technology, in sustainable agriculture and light manufacturing as well in a way that boosts island resilience. There was once a time when islands were the key to the wealth of the world. This can be possible again in this age of climate change. This time on our own terms. And to paraphrase a well known African saying, island solutions for island problems. This, in fact, calls for more inter island cooperation in investment in particular. This does not diminish our demand for climate justice, for environmental justice 
or for reparatory justice. For in the end, this set of structural challenges find their roots in colonization and institutional bias. It is high time that the global order currently being reordered better reflect the changed world that there is and respond to the imperatives of justice and equity. For St. Kitts and Nevis, this begins with the international finance architecture. As we in St. Kitts and Nevis mature to 40 years of independence this year, we can no longer sit idly by and be victims to an unjust international system that forces the most vulnerable to defend ourselves against ruinous debt, against disease and in fact disaster. In the spirit of my friend, anti-apartheid champion Randall Robinson, whom you laid to rest just last week here in St. Kitts and Nevis, I quote, we all have to die. And I preferred to have just one death. But it seems to me that to suffer insult without response is to die many deaths, end of quote. We need to begin to drive change. And in St. Kitts and Nevis, we are about to welcome our diplomatic and development partners and stakeholders to our Federation to reflect and recalibrate our international relations under the theme, driving change, advancing the vision for a sustainable island state. This will occur just after the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings in Washington DC, which are important because access to finance will be critical in this vision as if this vision was to have a chance. As we get ready to head into another hurricane season, we must no longer ignore the gap between the G7 and the G77, which is hindering our ambition to literally weather the storms. And so in this regard, I want to associate myself and associate my statement with that of my colleague, Prime Minister Motley of Barbados, made recently at the Commonwealth Ministers of Finance at the spring meetings, and I quote, one thing is sure, the status quo is not working for us. The continued discriminatory treatment between the global North and the global South cannot continue especially in a poly crisis, end of, war, end, of, end of quote. And so thanks to the laudable efforts of the Bridgetown Initiative, it was just mentioned by my colleague of Bermuda, we are now making dents. The global financial architecture is a neo-colonial one whose antiquated GDP per capita formulation is effectively locking small and vulnerable countries out of accessing critical finance for investing in resilience. I welcome therefore the meeting this June that Barbados and France will host to drive forward a new global financial pact. And while I am hopeful in the tenacity of my sister Miyamati, it is still disheartening to think that the last time the world met in Paris, a $100 billion climate finance package was made. Of course it did. Yet, this remains unrealized. And so it is my profound hope that this Paris meeting would yield a much better outcome. I also laud the decisive actions being taken by the Caribbean Development Bank in introducing and lobbying 
the international community for the implementation of the internal resilience capacity, the IRC, and also the recovery duration adjuster RDA, which privilege vulnerability and resilience so that its membership can access concessional financing. These two impactful ideas advance equity and provide a more accurate measurement for us. These efforts dovetail with our own determination that a multi-dimensional vulnerability index, the MDI, be recognized and implemented by the IFIs. For three decades, island states have led the movement toward a more inclusive measure of development. If there is one lesson that we should take from the pandemic where there was so much loss, it is this. Inequality is often the difference between life and death. For the small island states of the world, especially we here in the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, or the Pacific, we can no longer differ on this vital common sense tool. Neither should we let the momentum that we achieved at COP27 in Egypt on the loss and damage fund be put on the sidelines of COP28 in the United Arab Emirates. This is the result of a long march a long, long march to climate justice and its implementation will be vital for all of our countries. We are encouraged by some states like Scotland who have answered the call and urged the global community with the means to do so to step up. In fact, just last week, we learned that the biggest financial bank have been pouring $5 trillion into fossil fuels. Imagine the alternative where this much money is invested in island resilience. We need to have a partnership for progress. And so it is against this backdrop of the need to diversify our options for innovative financing that I wish to invite you, my friends, to St. Kitts and Nevis. We welcome you to join our diplomatic and de developmental partners next week for one of our own creation, Diplomatic Week, and visit us to become economic and commercial partners as we, adv as we advance the vision of a sustainable island state. This drive takes on more urgency for my country, owing to a global order that pretends, in the words of Calypsonian David Rudder in his famous tune to West Indies cricket, that we, and I quote, don't need islands no more, end of quote. We hope to show them otherwise. In so doing, we are now cultivating partnerships. We are sharing practices, my friends. We are engaging with more platforms like island innovation. And of course, inviting investors to the Federation to pursue win-win investments for sustainable development. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you so much, Minister Douglas, for that incredible intervention. And of course, we would love to take you up on the invite to join you in St. Kitts and Nevis. I also wanted to mention that your colleague, uh, the Honorable uh, Minister Joyal Clark, Minister yes. of Sustainable Development, will be speaking um, in a session um, later this week about the commitment of St. Kitts and Nevis to sustainability. So very much looking forward to that session. And as you mentioned, the um, the Bridgetown um, 
agenda. There will be a session later today where I'll be interviewing Avinesh Prasad, uh, who is one of the advisors to Prime Minister Motley on that. So we're very much supportive of everything you said. And thank you again for joining us here today to, to share that message. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to move on uh, back to the Pacific, embracing the um, discussion of uh, global island uh, uh, partnerships to introduce um, Minister Simon Kofi, the Minister for Justice, Communication and Foreign Affairs of the government of Tuvalu. Um, Minister Kofi embraces also these international island connections, having studied at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji and the international maritime, um, sorry, a degree in international maritime law from the University of Malta and having been a senior magistrate in Tuvalu since 2014, he has really um, campaigned for Tuvalu to be heard in terms of its risks um, around climate change, but also showing initiatives for Tuvalu to be a leader when it comes to finance on climate and other issues. So I'll now hand over to Minister Kofi for um, his intervention. Esteemed ministers, excellencies, and distinguished guests, talofa and warm greetings from Tuvalu. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Island Finance Forum and uh, as we gather to discuss sustainable and inclusive financial structures for island communities, we are reminded of the unique challenges faced by small island nations. Small island nations are grappling with a myriad of challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic, economic instability, and environmental degradation. Climate change is another existential threat that is disproportionately affecting our communities. Rising sea levels, more frequent natural disasters and ocean acidification are wreaking havoc on the fragile ecosystems and livelihoods of island communities. As the world looks to mitigate the impacts of climate change, it is essential that we ensure the voices of small island nations are heard and their needs are addressed. The Island Finance Forum provides an excellent opportunity to address these challenges head on. It is a platform where we can share expertise and insights on sustainable and inclusive financial structures for island communities. As we work towards promoting sustainable economic recovery and inclusive growth, we must take a holistic approach that is aligned with the values and priorities of island communities. Placing values at the center of our financial structures and solutions guarantees that the community's beliefs and principles will be integrated into the design, development, and deployment of the system. By doing so, we create a moral and ethical framework that shapes our decision-making processes and ensures that the system is aligned with the users' and stakeholders' needs, aspirations, and priorities. This approach allows us to build financial systems that are rooted in the community's values, promoting inclusion, sustainability, and fairness. And ultimately, integrating values into the financial system creates a sense of ownership and accountability, empowering the community to be active agents in shaping their financial future. In 2021, Tuvalu launched the Digital Nation Initiative in an effort to climate and future-proof our governance and administrative systems in the face of the climate crisis. The creation of a Digital Nation Online will ensure that the nation of Tuvalu can continue to function and exist regardless of the impacts of climate change. Although the initiative is future-looking and contemplates a worst-case scenario, it will, however, in the short term, improve the accessibility to government services, provide real-time data to support decision-making, and improve the overall efficiency of government. And as we embark on our initiative to create a digital nation, we are exploring decentralized network systems as the bedrock of our efforts. We firmly believe that decentralized systems such as blockchain can provide greater security and privacy for our citizens. And we urge you to consider their potential for your own societies. The, the benefits of decentralized systems are clear. They promote transparency and accountability making it easier to trace transactions and ensure that all parties involved are held accountable for their actions. 
Such a system can provide a strong foundation for sustainable and inclusive financial structures, enabling individuals to participate in the economy and prosper from its benefits. Island nations are often geographically isolated, making trade and commerce challenging. However, with the advance, advancement of technology, there is an opportunity for these nations to collaborate and explore blockchain technology that can enhance trade and cross-border transactions. By coming together and deciding on the use of a singular platform, we can establish a secure and reliable system for conducting transactions between island nations. By eliminating the need for intermediaries and reducing transaction costs, this platform could increase trade and economic activity among our nations. By working together and exploring such opportunities, island nations can unlock new economic opportunities and create a stronger regional economy. In conclusion, the Island Finance Forum presents a unique opportunity to address the challenges faced by small island nations. And as we gather to discuss sustainable and inclusive financial structures for island communities, it is essential that we take a holistic approach that aligns with our values and priorities. By placing values at the center of our financial solutions, we can create a moral and ethical framework that promotes inclusion, sustainability and fairness. And as we look to the future, we must embrace technological advancement and explore decentralized systems such as blockchain, which have the potential to enhance trade, increase economic activity and improve the lives of citizens in small island nations. Let us work together to build a more resilient, sustainable and inclusive future for all. Thank you for your time. Faftai Lassi, Tuvalu Modiadu. Thank you so much, Minister Kofe, for that intervention. And um, clearly, in terms of the climate crisis, all small island nations are faced um, with significant uh, challenges in the years ahead. And Tuvalu is perhaps one of, or if not the most, um, uh, at risk when it comes to this, but it's great to also see how Tuvalu is shifting the narrative to be a pioneer for new solutions and new approaches when it comes to these issues. Um, so now we're going to shift the tone slightly. We've had a series of interventions from uh, government representatives from islands in different parts of the world, but I'd now like to invite to the screen um, Kevin Cambridge, who is the advisory and ESG partner at PwC Bahamas. Now, PwC are our lead partner for this year's event, which we're very thankful for, and we're happy to have Kevin here. He um, he leads the advisory line of services as part of the regional cluster in the Caribbean and has over 20 years experience in the assurance and business advisory services with a primary focus on liquidations and forensic services. That's quite a mouthful, Kevin, hope I got that right. Um, and so Kevin, we're really interested to understand a little bit more um, about your work and specifically about how PwC approaches um, the issue of sustainability or sustainable development, or the term that you might use is ESG, environment, social governance. So maybe just to start off for those who might not be familiar with that terminology, you can tell us a little bit about what is ESG from PwC's standpoint and why there is such an interest in creating an e ESG framework specifically um, for the Caribbean region. Yes, thank you very much, James. And uh, before I kick off, uh, yes, you did me justice with the intro. Thank you very much. Um, and just greetings to everyone on behalf of not only PwC Bahamas, for which I'm the advisory partner and ESG partner, but also my colleagues and partners, staff in the region of the Caribbean, uh, from Bermuda to the north of us here in the Bahamas, all the way south uh, through Cayman, Trinidad, Jamaica, uh, Barbados, and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, what I hope to share with my, with my contribution this morning and, and this evening for some of you is just PwC's journey as it relates to ESG. Uh, I play the role uh, among many hats as the ESG coordinator and partner. So I have the privilege of interacting with all of the islands that I mentioned previously. In a nutshell, when you think of ESG, which is environmental and social governance, uh, there are three key or three key pillars. The environmental, as we stated before, which speaks to climate, uh, pollution control, water use. Uh, the S would be
be touching on diversification, uh, human rights, and, and areas within education and training. And the last bucket, uh, which would be governance, you would be touching on board diversity for the most part, ethics, and to an extent, financial statement disclosure, which I'll jump into. Your question was a very timely one with respect to PwC taking a very bold stance uh, and an active interest in ESG. And I'll, I'll just take you on a bit of a journey as to how that came about. Uh, PwC in 2022 launched uh, ESG and Corporate Governance Survey. And uh, that survey was quite critical in terms of us uh, beginning on that journey of ESG and, and sharing the knowledge both internally with PwC in the region and our staff. What we got from that survey was uh, there were some very startling statistics in our view. Uh, one of them that rang out was there was some 60% of the corresponding uh, boards that responded that stated that although ESG was something that they deemed important in terms of strategy, less than a third of them had ESG as an agenda item on their standing board meetings. So that was quite, uh, quite astonishing for us. But then what was e equally more disturbing is when you looked at our global statistics from uh, sources such as our 2023 uh, CEO survey, we saw that the, the opposite held true globally in terms of over 50% of the respondents in that survey stating that ESG was something that, uh, and climate change, having an impact on their organization for the next 12 months. So when we saw those results, James, we knew that we had some work to do in terms of upskilling, not only internally, but also externally to some of our clients, uh, some of our key clients and some of our prospective clients as well. Very interesting, thank you. So how, I mean, we're talking about your, your clients and companies in the region, but what are PwC's own commitments to ESG internally? And I think that'll also be helpful to understand how a company like yourself positions it for other companies to see what is a, a good example of ESG? Well, 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 James, without letting too much out of the bag, I would, I would say that in terms of PwC, there's a, a phrase in the Caribbean that you, you can't only talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. So one of the first things we, we do when we sit in front of boards and, and uh, I attend forums such as this is we want to do exactly what you said, share our own internal experiences because it grills credibility out there. So, uh, globally, PwC has taken a very bold stance to announce that we would go net zero by 2030. That is a global PwC initiative. But to answer your question more specifically, when it comes to PwC in the Caribbean region, we've actually taken some very granular steps to move us in that direction. For example, a number of our offices have already conducted what we call energy audits. Those energy audits would then uh, result in various recommendations that we would put in place, obviously, to take us further to that carbon neutral state. Uh, we've enacted various renovations with some of our offices. We've reduced floor space in some of those uh, jurisdictions that could afford to do so coming out of such audits. Uh, LED lighting, something as simple as AC units and, and increasing the, the temperature a few degrees as well as looking at solar panels and, and installing those in, in other offices. So as you can see, it's more than just lip service for us. It's actually uh, quite objective and measurable as we, as we go on in terms of ensuring that we are internally uh, projecting a lot of what we're preaching to our clients and prospective clients. Absolutely. So in terms of these environment, social governance um, frameworks or, or targets that are being made by companies. And I guess we're really talking about the private sector when it comes to ESG um, frameworks. Is there anything for the Caribbean as a region that is um, specific and that makes ESG and tackling ESG different to companies in other parts of the world? And where would you say the region stands when it comes to these ESG frameworks and this kind of implementation? I'm sure this okay. will we have people from island regions all over the world, but in this case, we're talking about the Caribbean, and I'm sure the answer will be relevant as well to other regions too. Well, most definitely. And what I'd like to do is answer your, your, your second question first with respect to whether we stand as a region. Before I mentioned, uh, obviously, our, our 2022 ESG and corporate governance survey, as I mentioned before, that gave us a really good stake in the ground to sort of determine where the various jurisdictions were. What was unique to that report as well, James, is that it was not only a consolidated Caribbean report, 
it actually was a segmented report that actually touched all of those islands that I mentioned in my opening. So we were able to, as a firm, go to the market in a very direct and specific way, as opposed to, as opposed to using a one size fits all. Um, answering the question once again as to where we are as a region, I would say that we're in the embryonic stages of ESG, but trending in the right direction. What do I mean by that? Uh, there's been a lot of buzz created by some of the jurisdictions that have been a bit more proactive than others in terms of regulatory regimes. When I say that, I think of the Bermuda Monetary Authority that's issued certain guidance as it relates to ESG. Uh, in the Bahamas, for example, we have a climate change and carbon market initiatives bill 2022. Uh, when you speak to accelerators, example, there's nothing better than regulation and, and, uh, and government acts to get people to take notice of what's going on as it relates to ESG. If I could speak even broader with respect to uh, taking the framework to the Caribbean, uh, as an accounting firm, we, we, a number of our clients and prospective clients for that matter, uh, conduct audits and report under IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Uh, if you do the research, and, and a lot of your listeners may and, and attending public may be aware of this, the IFRS has issued what we call prototype standards that are going to state exactly what they expect to see once these pronouncements become a reality. So one of the things that we see as a driver for companies, uh, our clients, prospective clients to sit up and take notice with ESG is the fact that eminently there will be reporting requirements. And as a trusted advisor, uh, PwC is positioned, we've positioned ourselves in a place where we can assist our clients. Okay, so it's interesting when when you, we see this um, this push in the region. I guess it seems like from what you're saying that that's mostly being made from the companies themselves, as opposed to being policy or government or, or, or government led. So where is that push towards moving to ESG coming from? Is is that did I take that right, understanding? Yeah, no, you, you, you got it partially right. There is equal. So you have situations where some of the island jurisdictions or island nations are a bit more proactive with legislation and some of their regulators are a bit more proactive. But to your point, there are a number of companies that operate internationally in terms of uh, securing finance. I mean, we're, we're talking about finance forum. Uh, they're seeking to attract international finance. And by virtue of that, they have to take ESG quite seriously because some of those investors and potential investors expect to see not only lip service, but they expect to see a real concrete strategic ESG plan that is serviced. Another driver is, if you look at capital finance from another perspective, uh, carbon credits is something that is becoming uh, sort of the, the craze in terms of people understanding what ESG is all about and looking at it from a capital raise perspective. So even in the Caribbean, there are clients and prospective clients that are evaluating potentially listing on a carbon credit exchange where they would be able to raise funds and, and hence service uh, some of their needs internally from a board perspective. But literally when we have these discussions with boards, and I'm speaking more sort of internally, uh, the drive really, for, for lack of a better phrase, is just the fear of being left behind. Uh, everything that I mentioned before, be it government, uh, be it regulatory, or be it internal, are all forces that we say are accelerators or drivers to push these entities to take ESG more, more seriously beyond just lip service. Absolutely. And I think for those, um, I'm just monitoring the chats and seeing kind of some of the comments and questions that are coming out. I think it's really important that everyone understands that the, the critical nature of ESG is to avoid greenwashing, is to yes. hold companies accountable by yes. having a framework to say, okay, anyone can say that they're environmentally friendly or doing the right thing for um, equality and social aspects, but how do we ensure that the frameworks are actually measurable and specific? So just so everyone in the audience is clear, this is about ensuring that we can actually measure these elements when it comes to corporate behavior in, in the region. And, and James, I, I can actually take it a step further when you speak to lip service. Uh, I spoke to the international financial reporting standards actually being something, but you look at other governing bodies like the SEC, uh, you look at other regulators that are out there. That really, it's just a matter of time before materiality is settled upon and mm -hmm. some of those pronouncements become a reality. So to the points that are being raised in the chat, uh, there are moves afoot to ensure that it's beyond, to your point, James, just lift service. No, abs absolutely. And I think the measurement aspect is the critical thing there. 
But with so much happening in the Caribbean, I mean, the Caribbean is the most tourism dependent region in the world. Obviously, the economy is much broader than tourism, but was particularly hard hit by the pandemic. And you might say is still in recovery mode, although things are vastly improved this year. How do you make sure that ESG stays as a relevant topic for organizations in the region when there are so many other things to be thinking about? Yeah, I, I think I've been getting some help along the way there, James. I, I had mentioned before uh, some of the island nations moving to actually enact legislation. Uh, I mentioned the Bahamas. I, I mentioned it in Bermuda as well. But the other thing that uh, is going to keep it relevant is, is actually, you know, forums such as this in terms of promoting the discussion on ESG, dispelling maybe some myths out there with respect to how ESG is really accounted for. And uh, I'll use an example, and I think you keep turning it back to PwC. Uh, what PwC decided to do uh, last year was dedicate an entire week. Uh, we turned it ESG week. And what that did was it gave us the opportunity to really upskill internally uh, with PwC throughout the region, invite a number of our clients and prospective clients to participate as well. Uh, and obviously, we incorporated some tools that, once again, reduce the sort of carbon footprint. Uh, we introduced the metaverse. Uh, for the first time in, in terms of the way we interacted. And uh, so it was once again an example where PwC was taking a very bold and firm commitment to demonstrate that, uh, to your point, we're paying more than just lip service. We dedicated that entire week. The outputs coming out of that was one, that we needed to do some more of those. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, that inaugural that happened last year is built upon this year and, and we, we again dedicate a full ESG week. But once again, it's it's in the same vein as we're, we're doing right now, just ensuring that there is an outlet to articulate exactly how practical discussions can take place and objective measurement can take place as it relates to ESG and strategy implementation along those lines. Okay, very interesting. So th there's been a movement in ESG and really putting these targets front and center by directly linking executive pay and corporate bonuses to ESG performance. Um, obviously, that's uh, that's one way of getting things done. What are your thoughts on that initiative? Yeah, so this is Kevin Cambridge's personal view uh, with respect to that. Um, if a company is committed uh, and, 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 and is committing their, their teams to thinking differently, I would say that certain aspects of ESG performance maybe can be evaluated along the lines of compensation and that could become critical. But I could say that when you bring that sort of measuring stick in place, it, it does demonstrate potentially to investors and stakeholders that the company is committed to change. One of the things in my personal view is you have to, however, stress that uh, there needs to be uh, a thought, you have to be thoughtful about the goals then that you're seeking to incentivize in terms of uh, bringing the correct or the reality in terms of behaviors to the forefront. So I would say that there's a bit of a balance there in ensuring that you're incentivizing the proper actions. Yeah, ab absolutely. So what would you see for the Caribbean region? And again, applying this to other island regions, what is next for ESG? There's obviously been, um, we, we've seen progress up until now and there's really momentum kicking off and it's great to see PwC's leadership when it comes to that. But what do you see as the next steps? I think you're going to see a bit of a shift and we're seeing it already in terms of our interaction with, with various boards and our various clients around the region. Uh, what's happening is you're seeing a move from a voluntary sort of world to a more reporting and mandatory one in terms of actual reporting. And I always say to boards, if, if there's nothing that will push you to take ESG seriously, it will be the reporting aspect of it. So, you know, we did touch on it in terms of what's coming down the pipeline in terms of financial statement disclosure, but I think that will only intensify. But I think it also provides opportunities. It provides opportunities, one, as I said before, to not get left behind, to really engage right now with a trusted advisor and take a look at where some potential opportunities are for an organization in terms of upskilling internally, but also looking for opportunities to increase market share and attract a customer base that is more in tune with ESG and ESG strategy along the way. Absolutely. And I think it's critical when we're having these conversations, we're, sh we're seeing the leadership from government, but obviously we need to ensure that the private sector is also on board when we're making goals on climate, which is so critical for the region and all the other aspects of environment, social governance. So 
thank you for sharing that crucial uh, insight into these topics because part of our goal with this forum, as I mentioned at the start, is really building a bridge between government policy and the private sector and the investments uh, and, and, and in, in different financial sectors, sorry. Um, often the language that is used even is so different in the different sectors, even if the goals are the same, that can be a challenge, I think, for making, making things move forward. So thank you very much for being here. Again, thank you to PwC for being part of this event. We have, if for anyone interested in these topics, we have Tomorrow and uh, Thursday, we have several other panel sessions on this with different other speakers from PwC who will be joining us. So do look out for those sessions for more insight into how the ESG framework is being implemented in the Caribbean and for other regions. Thanks again, Kevin. Great to have you thank, here. Thank you, James. And once again, thanks to Island Innovation for being uh, thought leaders out there. And, and it's been great with us partnering with you on this initiative. Over the next coming days, you will see how deep PwC's bench is in terms of some of our presenters and speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and so with that, we are coming to the close of this opening session. I think that was a really exciting way to set the tone for the next three days. Obviously, we have a lot of sessions coming up. We don't expect that everyone will be taking part in every session, but do make sure that you've bookmarked the sessions that appeal to you the most. Um, we're dealing with an international audience, so of course, some sessions might be in the middle of the night for you, um, but that means that uh, they're in the middle of the day for someone else. We really want to be inclusive with all regions of the world. But of course, every session from uh, this week will be available afterwards um, on recording, so we'll make sure that we share that library with you. But the more sessions that you can join live, the better. And of course, we will be making sure there are opportunities to submit questions and having more interactive sessions, which brings us now to the networking session. So uh, in the chat shortly, you should see a link to Remo. Um, Remo is the networking platform that we use on these events, and we'll invite you to join us over on that platform to have a chance to meet um, some of our team, some of the other attendees, possibly some of the speakers during the week, um, and make sure that you can uh, meet people because that's what these conferences are all about. Sometimes it gets lost in the virtual format, but we have a very exciting platform. So see the link in the chat that uh, my colleagues Linda and Christian have shared. You can open this link in the browser and as soon as you're in Remo, feel free to exit Zoom and jump over to there. In case you haven't used Remo before, I'm just going to share a few recommendations on how to use it now. But if you're already comfortable and you're in, feel free to jump out and get going and start meeting the other attendees. Um, so Remo is a virtual platform. It allows you to connect, make networking opportunities, and to interact with people. So if you're joining, be prepared to speak, to have a conversation. Um, it's great to have your camera on if possible, and use the chance to share a bit about what you're doing, but also listen. Make sure you're listening to what other people have on offer. You can see on the screen now um, the show, and I, already we have about 50 people who've joined in there and have got conversations going. Each of the tables has a different topic. And so double click on any of the tables to learn about risk and insurance, startup ecosystems, blue economy, or whatever topic it is that you'd like to join. We do recommend that you join on a laptop. Um, smartphones do work sometimes, but are less predictable. So we would recommend you joining on a desktop or a laptop if possible. Um, and there you'll be able to see an opportunity to um, make sure your camera and speaker are set up. Um, you also ideally use Chrome. Uh, Google Chrome, if you have that browser, tends to be the best one to use. Um, so with that, we will leave this session open. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be here for a few more minutes and you can type in the chat to make sure um, you're able to join us. But um, in a few moments, we will close this and move over for the networking. So thank you so much for being here uh, for this session. Looking forward to seeing you at the various other sessions throughout the week. 
We'll see you in the networking now. And if you're available in a few hours, um, there's a really good session happening later on where I'll be interviewing Professor Avinash Pasaud, the special advisor to Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, about the Bridgetown initiative that was mentioned by some of the speakers there. So I do hope to see you in that session. And thank you for being here for the first session of the Island Finance Forum. Enjoy the conference and have a great time. Bye-bye.